West Springfield High School's Applied History presents FCPS Through the Decades. Chapter 2, 1910 to 1920. Hello and welcome to the second episode of FCPS Through the Decades. I am Eric Tannehill, temporary unpaid intern extraordinaire, and I will be your host of this educational and hopefully entertaining series where we examine significant decades in FCPS history and analyze how these events relate to a broader cultural and historic perspective. In this episode, we will talk about one of the largest movements to educate black children in the South, the legacy of the longest serving superintendent, and the not at all timely topic of pandemic handling. And we'll end with a bang. In the early 1900s, Fairfax County got its first public high school for white students. Prior to this time, if you were white, you could pay tuition to attend one of several schools in Fairfax County that offered coursework above grade seven. In 1907, the combined Fairfax County School Board authorized public funding for the operation of high schools in the towns of Clifton and Falls Church. Clifton High School is regarded as the first public high school in the county. However, in 1914, Herndon High School actually became the first fully accredited four-year high school in Fairfax County. Herndon was also the first school in Fairfax County to offer business courses and to have an athletics department. A similar transition in the schooling system gradually took place across the U.S., and Herndon High School is a good example of the transition of high school actually becoming expected of more people. Culturally speaking, Fairfax was very focused on its agriculture, so many of the first high schools offered vocational education in agriculture on topics like animal husbandry. See, at this time, Fairfax County was largely a dairy farming community and was the largest supplier of milk to Washington, D.C. The introduction of public high school and the compulsory education legislation of the 20th century meant it gradually became less and less likely for girls and boys to leave their education early to work on a farm. Another high school opened in October 1914. It had six classrooms and an auditorium. Located in McLean, the school was named after Franklin Sherman, a former school trustee of Providence District. At Herndon and McLean, these large multi-story buildings were called high schools, but they actually educated students from grades 1 to 11. There was no 12th grade until the 1940s. So, you might be thinking, why did Fairfax County all of a sudden start to have public high schools? Well, at the turn of the 20th century, times were changing. In the 19th century, you had the founding of the towns of Clifton, Dunloring, Herndon, and Wheelie in Fairfax County. What did all these new towns have in common? They were located along railroads, which cut through the county. The railroads brought commerce to these areas and made travel significantly faster. Then, in the early 20th century, you have the interurban trolley system built in Fairfax County. This leads to the rise in the first true suburban communities. Franklin Sherman High School's location near the trolley line through McLean was no mistake. For the first time, students from outlying areas could travel by trolley to school. Keep in mind, when I'm talking about high schools, I mean high schools for white children. The first public high school for black children in Fairfax County wouldn't open for another couple of decades, four decades to be exact, in 1954, which is just another example of the constitutionally mandated segregation disproportionately impacting people of color. Speaking of Virginia's 1869 constitution, aka the Underwood Constitution, you know, the one I mentioned last episode, in 1902, it was revised by the conservative Southern Democrats to make voter registration harder for African Americans. Now, you may be thinking, Eric, why didn't you mention this last episode when you were focusing on that time period? And the answer is, I forgot. Moving on from my mistakes. From a larger perspective, the disenfranchisement of African-American adults and the exclusion of African-American children from higher education is a good example of how Southern states did everything they could to oppress African-Americans and prevent them from changing their socioeconomic situation and gaining political power. Now, the more historically minded of our listeners may have noticed that I haven't mentioned another pretty big event of national and international importance that took place in the 19-teens and its effect on schools. World War I. Yeah, you know, that war. Yeah, this is mostly due to the fact that there isn't a lot of historical documentation about FCPS from that era that has survived into the modern day. So the records on what happened during World War I and how it affected Fairfax County public schools don't really exist. Not anymore, at least. Now we can make a few educated guesses 
but we don't know anything for certain. There probably was a shortage of male teachers because men were enlisting and being drafted into military service. So the balance of teaching staff during this time would have predominantly been female. Boys who were of age to enlist in the army would have most likely already finished their education, so the student body wouldn't have changed all that much. But frankly, these are just hypotheses. Another huge event took place during the 19-teens, the outbreak of the influenza that started in 1918. It's commonly known as the Spanish flu, but that's because Spain didn't censor information about the pandemic, unlike other countries. Both the Allied and Central Power nations tried to suppress news outlets from reporting on the viral outbreak, claiming that the censorship was because they wanted to keep morale up in their countries during that tough wartime. Historians still don't really know where the outbreak started, but most agree the influenza outbreak of 1918 did not start in Spain. There's a chance it may have even started in the United States because the first known case was reported in Kansas. Like World War I, we don't really know what happened in schools. The documents we do have don't really say anything about the actual pandemic, and we're missing a lot of school documents that might have contained more information. However, we were actually able to track down a couple news articles about the influenza outbreak and how it affected Fairfax and its schools. It isn't a lot, but it's something to work with. From the Alexandria Gazette, October 29th, 1918. Quote, both the Episcopal Theological Seminary and high school will reopen tomorrow after being closed on account of the influenza. The high school closed four weeks ago so that it might safeguard the boys from the epidemic. About 25 boys were attacked with it, but all the cases were comparatively mild and there were no deaths. The seminary suspended its lectures nearly two weeks ago so that the students might give assistance in nursing the sick and in helping in other necessary ways during the dearth of nurses and hospital workers in this and other cities. There has been no case of influenza at the seminary. There have been some cases on the hill outside the seminary. Among these has been Mr. Victor Donaldson. Services will be regularly resumed at the seminary chapel and all missions Sunday. End quote. The seminary school was a private school located in what is today the city of Alexandria. However, that part of Alexandria was part of Fairfax County until the 1950s. We'll talk about its annexation in a later episode. From this, we can extrapolate that people in Fairfax were very aware of the influenza outbreak, and when it reached them, they implemented a brief quarantine period to slow or stop the spread in schools and churches. As Fairfax was still very rural, it's likely that most county residents wouldn't need to take drastic steps as opposed to those who lived in larger, less isolated communities, such as Fairfax, Falls Church, Herndon, McLean, and Vienna. There's another article I want to read because it's so reminiscent of the modern era, it's actually a bit scary. From the Alexandria Gazette, December 14, 1918. Quote, There is a possibility of it again becoming an epidemic. Dr. R. P. Sandige gives rules for its prevention. No occasion for alarm. Numbers of new cases of influenza are being reported to this office daily. I do not desire to be an alarmist, nor to cause the people of Alexandria to become panicky, but I feel it my duty to warn them that there is a possibility of influenza becoming epidemic in this community again, says Dr. R. P. Sandige, assistant surgeon USPH. In a large measure, influenza in epidemic proportions may be prevented by people following a few simple rules which are cover each cough and sneeze with handkerchief, avoid crowds, do not use common drinking cup and common towels, do not spit on floors or sidewalks, if taken ill, go to bed and send for a doctor. I make an earnest appeal to all citizens of Alexandria, Virginia, to follow the above rules and do your bit towards preventing another epidemic of influenza. Be fair to your neighbor and city. Stay at home if you have a cough, a cold, or are sick. End quote. It's definitely interesting to see how 100 years ago, the doctors of 1918 were telling people to follow basically the same guidelines to prevent the spread of diseases that we're using now. My mom walked in while I was writing the script and read the article over my shoulder. All she said was, I think Anthony Fauci is a time traveler. Oh god, I've just started another conspiracy theory, haven't I? Ugh. As a quick aside, I just wanted to say every single piece of history is in some way a guess or biased. We're dealing with a lot of primary sources or lack thereof in this episode. So I just want to clarify that it is a historian's job to look over primary documents and then assemble them into a cohesive story, which means when there aren't records, historians need to fill in the cracks as best they can. 
However, a lot of people don't seem to realize that the opposite is also true. When historians have a large amount of documentation, it's their job to decide what matters and what doesn't, meaning things get left out all the time. Additionally, primary resources only tend to document things that are either out of the ordinary or what the culture of the time views as important, meaning that we need to assume what ordinary and unimportant things were. If we're thinking about this in modern terms, you don't see newspaper articles about the existence of toilets or the fitness gram pacer test happening at your local middle school. It would be a historian's job to sift through documents to make the educated guess that we have toilets and kids in middle school need to take an arbitrary test. Just remember to be critical of every historical document you see. Except us. We're the best. We don't forget to mention important things and need to backfill that information later. We're professionals. I mentioned last episode and earlier this episode how African Americans had less educational opportunities because there were less schools they were allowed to attend with worse funding and quality than the schools of their white peers. This was an issue all over the South, where at this point in history, basically all Southern states had some form of Jim Crow laws or laws that legally mandated segregation based on race. One way that the lack of access to schools was combated was the Rosenwald Foundation. In the early 20th century, the Rosenwald Rural School Building Program built state-of-the-art schools to advance the education of African-American children in the southern United States. The program was created by Booker T. Washington and the Tuskegee Institute and was funded by philanthropist Julius Rosenwald, president of Sears Rosebook Company. From 1970 to 1932, the Rosenwald Foundation donated $4.4 million to construct approximately 5,000 schools in the rural south. At least three schools were constructed in Fairfax County using fund data donated from the Rosenwald Foundation. So we call them Rosenwald schools, simply because Rosenwald donated funding for them. But really, they should be called Booker T. Washington schools because they were his brainchild. As president of Sears and Roebuck, Julius Rosenwald initially thought Sears and Roebuck should manufacture prefabricated schoolhouse kits, similar to Sears catalog homes. But Booker T. Washington insisted that the local community needed to handle the construction of the buildings because doing so would foster community involvement in the school and provide a source of employment during construction. It was also decided that the foundation funding should only partially cover the cost of a new school and that matching funds would need to be raised by the community and the local school board. In addition to funding, the Rosenwald Foundation supplied plans for schoolhouses, guidance on how school sites should be chosen, and directions on which way the school should face to maximize the use of natural light. This emphasis on the importance of natural light was quite ingenious for a number of reasons, and is something Fairfax County only began to revisit in school construction in the last 20 years. What's also very interesting is that the school building layouts were designed by architect Robert Robinson Taylor, the first African-American graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. While the Rosenwald Foundation's donations undoubtedly helped African-American children, its funding ran out at the worst possible time, the start of the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, there were significant systemic issues with funding and the construction of schools for white and African-American children. But African-American children were affected much, much more severely. An example of this in Fairfax County would be East Woodford, an African-American enclave near the town of Vienna that was named after a trolley station. After repeated petitions, the school board failed to provide the residents of East Woodford with a schoolhouse, so community members took matters into their own hands and pooled their money to purchase a building. The only pictures of this building that are known to survive can be seen in the special collections holding of Virginia State University. When you compare the condition of that building with the two-story brick school houses white children were using at this time, it is shocking and heartbreaking to see. So the school board, remember, they didn't want to fund it in the first place, complained on multiple occasions that the East Woodford schoolhouse was unsuitable. But time and time again, the board passed over opportunities to build a new school for this community. Their financial priorities were clearly elsewhere. Okay, that was heavy stuff. When I first took this unpaid internship, I made it clear that I was not sugarcoating FCPS's history or trying to smooth over its rougher sides. The racism and segregation in this county and many other counties in the South hurt African-American children and prevented many from getting the education they deserved. We'll talk about the modern ramifications of this in a later episode. But 
I don't want to end this episode negatively, so let's talk about FCPS being in a commercial. In the 1920s, cars were really starting to be used by members of the public. In 1924, the Ford Motor Company created a silent film entitled The Road to Happiness. The Road to Happiness was used to promote the improvement of roads in rural localities and was shown throughout the United States. Portions of the film were shot in western Fairfax County and many local residents were featured as extras. One of the locations featured was the Navy School. The teacher shown in the film was the actual teacher of the school, Louise Rinker Harrison. The film showed school children walking to school on muddy roads and scraping the mud off their shoes before entering the schoolhouse. It also showed a horse and buggy getting a wheel stuck due to the poor quality of the roads. Basically, what I'm saying is FCPS was the before picture in an infomercial. The ad campaign actually worked because eight years later, in 1932, the Virginia General Assembly passed the Byrd Road Act that created the forerunner to the Virginia Department of Transportation. And in 1933, 90 counties, including Fairfax, opted in to state control of the secondary roads system. Secondary roads were given route numbers and rapid improvements were made to local roadways, making it possible for school buses to become a reliable mode of transportation. Ah, capitalism, you've done it again. Improvement made for selfish reasons. I also promised we'd end this episode with a bang, so two different schools were completely destroyed in the 20s. Vienna Elementary was destroyed during the winter of 1920, and the boiler that was used to heat the building exploded. The accident happened in the middle of the night, and fortunately no one was hurt, but the explosion and resulting fire reduced the school to ashes. And in January of 1927, Herndon High School was completely destroyed by a fire. Also, for any of you who care, Milton Dunley Hall, the superintendent I talked about last episode, retired in 1929 after serving for 43 years, which will likely forever hold the record of longest serving superintendent in FCPS history. Because, I know, All you listeners were really hanging on the edge of your seat for that one. In a broader context, the early 20th century was a time that showed the continuing evolution of the education system and what we know it as today, with public high schools becoming more common. This also marks a time when transportation technology's advancements started affecting communities and the types of infrastructure prioritized. Starting the shift from trolleys to cars with the increasing amount of paved roads making cars a feasible means of transportation. And, of course, the many different ways segregation and the inequalities that came with it harmed people of color. It may feel repetitive for me to continually mention racism, but... Racism is a continual issue that appears throughout the entirety of United States history, especially in southern states. Thank you for listening to this episode of FCPS Through the Decades. I hope you continue listening. Next episode, we get to hear about the second longest serving FCPS superintendent, something called the Consolidation Movement, and how the Great Depression and World War II affected schools. That's all for today, but we have attached all sorts of information in the episode description if you want to learn more about anything I've talked about. This episode of FCPS Through the Decades was written and directed by Eric Tenhill, with script editing by Tara Whipke and Jeff Clark, and sound editing and visual art by Tara Whipke. For more information, go to fcps.edu and search using the keywords Our History.